everybody. Ah. A lot of faces here. That's good. That's good. I wanted to say that now, now for the first time in its history, the the, um, the centuries-old mystery of why the tarot works can now be explained, and that's a breakthrough. That's that's huge because um, it's not. Uh, it's always been something that nobody could ever really say why it worked before. And uh, I'm not talking about a gray theory uh, that I have. I'm talking about with conclusive facts now, this could be explained. My work on this is the first of its kind, but I'm sure others will follow. So we're on the ground floor with this right now. But that's always been a, the piece of the puzzle that's been missing, is why does it work? And... Um, it's kind of hard to learn something if you're trying to study this tarot if you don't understand why it works. So this is going to open up doors of understanding in ways that we never had before. Pappas wrote uh, Bohemians, uh, Bohemian, uh, Tarot of the Bohemians in 1880s. And um, in that book, right in his preface, he starts out, second paragraph, he says, it's application and construction has not yet been revealed so far as I know. And then he, then he writes, goes on to write about 300 pages of precise instruction about tarot cards, which is kind of hard to do if you don't know the application and construction of what you're writing about. Eden Gray wrote um, The Complete Guide to the Tarot in 1970. And she used the reissued Rider Weight deck, which just came out that year, too. And that, that book was a no-nonsense, clearly written book on how to read tarot cards. And I think that that book is really the reason the writer deck became so popular, because it just came out again, and it was a clearly written book on how to read tarot cards. And in that book, in her chapter, chapter 5, How to Read the Cards, she says, for some reason that we don't yet understand, your subconscious mind shuffles the cards but only does this after you've learned them completely. So another thing, like it's just gray talk about something you can't really confirm in any way. And that's, uh, that's always been the problem. And you can't improve something if you can't explain it. So we haven't been able to improve anything with the tarot application because we never really knew how it worked to begin with. So we've been forced to use paint-by-numbers applications with the tarot cards and uh, tarot card template or tarot card spread templates, stuff that was already in place and we couldn't really do anything with because uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Authors write we don't know why it works, but if you do this, 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 and this exactly this way, you get good results, and that's all you need to know. And that's what we've been forced to do. Paint by numbers applications. So what do we do when we do a card reading? You know, we have a question we don't have an answer for. We apply a tarot card reading. We find new insight, new ideas, new answers. And if we if we uh, move forward on these ideas, um, and they work, that's an accurate prediction. And what do we do when, with, when we have that? We look at these cards and we say, how can a deck of cards do this? We keep looking at these cards. We look at them under a microscope, because we don't know the application. We don't know what else to do. All we got is the cards to look at. And we've really done a lot with that. We've sort of overdone it, I think. The mystery of the tarot has never been in the cards. It's been in the application. A lot of people don't know the difference between a strategy and a tactic. There's really no reason to know it. Most of the time, you don't really need to know that. But if I'm going to build a house, a blueprint of that house would be a map of my strategy. 
and the hammers and saws and other tools I used to build the house would be considered tactics. The good rule of thumb is a tactic you can touch and a strategy you don't even see unless you make a map of it. The tarot has tactics and strategies too. And you can look at it the same way. The card spread is a strategy and you never see it. You only see the cards that are laid into it. The card spread. This is the Celtic cross card spread. You never see this on your table. You only see the cards that are laid into it. You don't see this. This is the strategy of your, of your reading. Each, each numbered position in this card spread is an aspect of your question. It's like your question broken apart into chapters. And we look into each particular aspect of the question. Tarot cards are laid into those positions to spark ideas for answers to these positions. That's how it works. And most people don't realize that this is your question broken apart. And these are the answers to that question. So this has a lot to do with it. And it's not really talked about much. But this is very important. This is the strategy of your reading. So when we lay tarot cards into these positions, if, if I have position three, or let's say position five on my, on my Celtic cross is an asset the client has that they should use to try to achieve what they're looking into. This tarot card that's laid into that position is there to spark ideas as far as what kind of things that they have going for them. And, um, what they can do here. So it's, I'm, I'm forced to use my imagination now to take this random tarot card and make it make sense with position five as an asset that's something the client has going for them that they can use. Whatever that card happens to be, it's a random stimulus of some type that's supposed to spark imagination for me and intuition to come up with ideas that would be useful for the client to know. That's what we're doing with the card spread. And that's what we're doing with tarot cards. Random tarot cards are placed into these positions, forcing the reader to make associations between the, the position's meaning and the tarot card in relation to the client's question. This is what we're doing with a card spread. This is important, and a lot of people don't really see it or think about it that much. You can get a lot of books on the tarot. You might have 350 pages on the tarot. Ten of them will be about this. And 300 of them are going to be about the cards. When we're talking about the cards, we've talk, we, like I said, we look at them under a microscope. And because we're so fascinated, we say, how can a deck of cards do this? Really, what you're doing there is it's like I built that house and after the house is done, I look at my hammer and start and say, how did these tools build this house? It's the same thing. We're looking too much into the tactic and not the, car, and not the spread itself. The spread is the strategy of the whole thing. If I use position meanings that are beneficial to that client, I'm going to have useful answers from these cards that I, that I lay into those positions. That's what a, that's what a card spread does. Today, this would be known as an intentional application of thought, used to spark ideas for me to find answers for you and your questions. A random stimulus in the form of tarot cards placed into those positions forced me to make associations between the card and the position's meaning in relation to your question we're looking into. This forces me to use my imagination, and imagination is the gateway to your intuition, using the same side of the mind. If I use what I know, I'm using my logic and reason to find answers. If I'm forced to use my imagination and intuition, I'm using a different side of the mind now where I could find new ideas. Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge, with our knowledge, 
we can't find anything new. That's already known, the knowledge. That's stuff we know already. If you want to find something new, you have to have imagination. So this is how a card spread works. And that's the diagram of a card spread. One of many. Whatever the positions are really is important. So the horseshoe spread, the Celtic cross, gypsy spread, it makes no difference. The pattern on the table, what's really important is what these positions mean as far as the person's question goes. I could lay this out in a different pattern, it doesn't make any difference. What position six is, what, mean, what does that mean to this person as far as the question goes? That's what's important. Well, position five, position seven, what do these positions mean? They're just questions. And the tarot is, a, is like an idea generator. It just sparks ideas to make that we didn't see before. The mindset of a tarot reading is... The mindset of the tarot cards is so strong, it's centuries old, of this mysterious deck of cards that has this unexplainable power to it that can predict the future. And it's a very strong illusion. But if you were to erase all of that and erase the history of the tarot, and, you just, and the tarot came out today, brand new, never came out before, just today, this wouldn't be seen as anything that big of a deal at all. If you went to your friends and said, hey, you see these new things called the tarot cards? It's really kind of neat. You lay out, a, lay out questions, you find answers for them. You're going to have people say, oh, yeah, I took that in college. That's a creative thinking technique. That's called uh, conceptual blending, what you're doing there. This is a, a, a identical to what's being done in science, in medicine, in technology, in the arts, all of your Fortune 500 companies, branches of our government like NASA, the Pentagon, they all use the same exact application of thought that we're using right here. It's identical. The only difference is, is not, they don't force themselves to use tarot cards for a random stimulus to find answers. There's people in place right now, you could take college courses on this, the same application. There's people who make a living right now called creative consultants who will be working for those things I just mentioned, Fortune 500 companies and, and medicine and pharmaceuticals and, and uh, huge projects. And they're doing exactly the same thing the tarot reader is doing. The only difference is the tarot reader limits their random stimulus to a deck of 78 cards called the tarot to be placed in elements of a question, segments of the question we're looking into. Where the cons creative consultant will use anything in the world for a random stimulus. And things found in this room, things found in the hardware store, doesn't make any difference. Anything in the world can be used. This would be something maybe a think tank would be looking into. It's the same thing. It's, a, it's your question broken apart. Information, the feelings we have about it, positive aspects, negative aspects, creative ideas and conclusions. It's just your question broken apart. And if you have, an in, if you have a question, if you have an, a section of your question where you're stuck for an answer, you can't use what you've learned because that's why you're stuck. There's nothing there. It's going to keep looping in your head, dead end, dead end, dead end. You have to use your imagination to find an idea. And that's done by adding something totally random to that element of the question, forcing you to make associations between this total randomness that has nothing at all to do with my question and that aspect in my question itself. Anything that's ever been invented was done by taking something we're totally familiar with and adding it to an element of our question that we're trying to find answers to. I brought this as an example. Christmas, we just had these hanging around. And I, grabbed, I said, this would be a good example. Louis Braille. Louis Braille was a young boy, and he became blind because of illness of some type. I think it was a rheumatic fever. 
and um, so now he's blind. He's in the backyard. His father's working in the, in the yard, and he's sitting under a tree, and he's wishing he could read a book again. And um, as he's sitting there thinking about it, he's feeling around the ground, and he picks up a pine cone. And he's touching the points on the pine cone. He thought, well, what if they put points on paper in certain formations that would represent letters of the alphabet, and we could touch words instead of reading them with our eyes? This is a random stimulus that came up with a new idea called Braille, by Braille. This is how our mind naturally works anyway. Now we have intentional applications that do exactly that same thing. And we know that that's, that works. Here's the Hubble telescope example. I mentioned this briefly last time I was here, just for a second. Let's say this was a think tank, and you were all a bunch of rocket scientists, and we worked for NASA. And we're here, this is the 90s now, and we're, our project is the Hubble telescope. It's a, we're to launch a telescope into deep space, outside of the Earth's atmosphere, and to, um, to see what's out there. And um, I'm a creative consultant that's been hired to work with you to find ideas here. Now, if we look at all these, we look at the positions. I, we just have four positions here. I'm sure they had a lot more. This is probably a big whiteboard up here. And I would be up here, and you'd be down there. We'd all be talking about this stuff. Now, how are we going to navigate the telescope? How are we going to power it? How are we going to, the purpose of the thing? We, so the certain, most, these three of these aspects we could figure out. Now, we know how to navigate things in space. We know how to power stuff, nuclear power, solar power. There's different ways to do that. The purpose is obvious. We want us looking in space. The Hubble telescope was almost um, trashed. They almost let it go. They couldn't figure out how they're going to focus this thing because a telescope focuses by extending and retracting its length. And you can't design something to focus light years away. You couldn't physically make that happen. They couldn't figure out how they're going to focus this thing. So they almost gave up on it. So let's say I'm a creative consultant. I'm working with you. We need a random stimulus for this. If I look at this logically, I'm going to look at microscopes. I'm going to look at binoculars, eyeglasses, camera lenses, things like that, which was, you know, it's the, sort of the same trend there, sort of the same things in the mind. There's nothing there. It's just going to loop. So I have to find something that's going to really throw my imagination off, and we got to work with that. So I tell you all, I said, okay, focusing the Hubble telescope, think of things you find in the bathroom that will help us focus the Hubble telescope. Now that's bizarre. So you got you got a shower curtain, you got a medicine cabinet, you got a sink, I got a shower head. What about the shower head? You can adjust and retract and open up the, the stream of water to a wide mist to a short direct flow. What if we used the principles of the shower head and instead of flow of water, the flow of light coming through it and the depth of field, would that work? The Hubble telescope became a, a success because they looked at a shower head. That's called conceptual blending today. That's an intentional application of thought because I said, Think of things you find in the bathroom. Another one was the heat-seeking missile, air-to-air -air missile. They wanted, Pentagon wanted a, a missile that a high-speed jet could hit another high-speed jet with. And um, so they had different categories, maybe kind of detonation, um, uh, how they're going to power the missile, and how, they, how many they're going to carry, and whatever. One of them was, how are they going to hit the target? And they couldn't figure out a way to do that. So a, a, concept, a creative consultant would say, think of things you find in the desert that will help us aim a missile at another high-speed jet from one high-speed jet to another. And they came up with the sidewinder rattlesnake because the sidewinder rattlesnake buries himself in the sand and waits for something to walk by. And it senses the body heat. Then it springs out and attacks, just feeling senses, goes toward the heat. And the first heat seeking, they came up with the first heat seeking missile because of that. And it was called the Sidewinder for that reason. That's conceptual blending. 
How can a rattlesnake help an air-to-air -air missile hit a target? How could a pine cone help the blind read? How could a shower head help us see into deep space? Conceptual blending. I could go on and on with examples of this, but they're out there and you could read them yourself. This is how it works. But see, and we know how it works now, we have, like I said, intentional applications of thought in place to make us think this way when we want to. When you look at these two applications, you see that they're identical. The card reading and a creative thinking technique. It's for the same reason. An idea is a prediction. So it's for the same reason, to find an idea of something to still be done in the future. I think we could make a telescope that will focus if we use the shower head. That's a prediction that worked. I think we could, the blind could read if we put points on paper like a pine cone. That's a prediction. They did it and it worked. Any idea you have is really a prediction because you haven't done it yet. You all predicted you're coming here tonight. Look at how good you are. <laughs> Nobody's sitting here right now thinking, how did I know I was going to be here? You know, just. So we've, we've learned 90% of what we know about the mind we've learned in the last 50 years, maybe even less than that. I've been involved with the tarot for 50 years. This application hasn't moved because the tarot reading because we haven't understood what we're doing. But psychology and cognitive science has moved a lot. And now we can look at this stuff and say, this is what we're doing. This is why it works. There's no more mystery to it. The mystery is in the mind. That's still a mystery. Everybody's mind works differently. And the hardest thing I have as far as a teacher, I don't want to teach you how to read like me. You'll never read like me. I want to teach you how to read like you. So I can tell you what I'm doing to give you a picture of how to do it yourself, but if you're going to chase your tail trying to read like me, you're going to spend your whole life thinking, boy, I wish I could read like Vince. I wish I could read like Vince. That's not what you want to do. You want to learn how to read like you. I could never read like any of you either. We all think differently. So the mind is where the mystery is. What, why, how, and when? A, a typical analyzing a question, breaking it apart in the, in the sections, adding a random tarot card to stimulate ideas, to force us to think about what is this real question we're looking into? Why do we want this in our life? How are we going to get it? And when do we act? The cards help us come up with original ideas instead of just using our logic. This is called a random stimulus. A tarot card added to our question sparks ideas, forces us to use our imagination and our intuition. Today, this is known as conceptual blending. You can Google that when you go home tonight, and you can start reading about it, and you'll, you'll connect the dots to what I'm talking about. Card spreads, are, or card meanings of cards. My book, Essential Tarot, the black one, I mapped out each card like this for meaning. I also have a three or four sentence definition on each card too, just because that's what all traditional books do. A lot of sources will tell you To memorize a card each day for 78 days. The tarot is not a dictionary, so memorizing a card meaning isn't going to really help you much. I use keywords. And keywords drift into other words. So these are key words for the fool. All you need is one key word, really, to drift off into 
One key word can drift off to actually basically everything in the world if you just keep it drifting. If you could have this map just keep on going and going and going, actually it'll drift off to all, all, the, card, all the meanings. And they'll start drifting off into other cards' meanings. So they're all interconnected, all the tarot cards. The way key words work and why they're so much better is if I tell you with three or four sentences that this card means this, then you're memorizing a meaning that I told you the card means. If I tell you that. But if I use key words, if I, let's say the five of swords, and I tell you the five of swords, the key word for that is change. It means something's changing. And if I were to tell all of you, if you have paper and pencil, I would tell all of you, write down five words that come to mind from the word change. And you all had to write down five words, or five things, maybe two or three word sentences or whatever, five things that come to, from the word change. And you all did that. We could, prepare, we could compare all those notes, and I bet you a lot of them, most of it would be different from each, from each person. Everybody's going to see it a little differently. I might have spare change, I might have change of heart, I might have alteration, moderation, transformation. You might have something else, you have something else, you have some, we're all gonna think differently. But when you use key words, you're seeing the cards through your eyes instead of mine. And that's the only way you really become a real reader is when you're reading the cards through your own eyes. Instead of memorizing what I'm saying, you're figuring out from your own insight. Tarot has a lot of um, a lot of changes that well, a lot of people are trying to do things with it over the years. I've seen so much change over the years because people are trying to find answers to what the cards are doing and trying to find a better better mousetrap of things. Um, when I first got involved with the tarot, that was just the tarot of Marseille readily available. And so I was lucky because I there wasn't any choices. Today you have so many different decks out there, you can't, you can't keep track of them. They have, they've really done horrible things with some of them. You know, they, have, they have Native American tarot. I don't know how they got that. Native American tarot, they never got involved with the tarot. They have gummy bear tarot. Can you imagine doing a reading for somebody and somebody gives you $100 for a reading, they got a serious issue going on, you pull out a deck of gummy bear tarot cards, you say, cut the, cut the cards, like, we got to get in touch with our inner gummy bear. You know? You know? <laughs> they have James Bond tarot, tarot of baseball, the tarot of the cat people. Um, and, and, if, and then they have the more serious decks, and we've taken those decks and we've like I said, we've looked at them under a microscope. I'm, I, Tarot Marseille is so basic, and that's usually what I use. My, I just made a deck. It's the Tarot Marseille. And to judge a deck of tarot cards when I first started come, coming around would be like judging a deck of playing cards. If you don't like them, that's too bad. That's all they are. You know, There's nothing more you're going to do about it. You don't like tarot cards, you don't like them. That's all there is to it. But... Um, <clears throat> We've um, looked so closely into the cards. Examples are the um, Empress of the Rider Waite. She wears, she has 12 stars in her crown and um, to represent the 12 signs of the zodiac. It doesn't make any difference. I'm, I've, I use that deck. I never count those stars in her crown. I don't care how many stars she's got. Most, if I use the Marseille deck, she doesn't have st stars in her crown at all. If you use uh, the, the Toth deck, it's a different look. So each, each deck has a, a book with the deep symbolism of it in there for the card. And then you go to another deck, and they have the, the symbolism of that deck in this book. And you, you realize we're, we're looking at things we don't even use. You could do it. You could do it when you realize that it's a conceptual blending, a creative thinking technique. You could use a deck of postcards and do a reading. 
It's a tactic. It might not be as good of a tactic. Just like a car is a tactic to get here tonight. You could have got to, to use a bicycle. You could have got here, but it wouldn't be as good of a tactic tonight as a tech, as a, as an automobile would be because of the weather. But you get the job. You could have got the job done. So I mean, to really think it's that important to um, to look into the symbolism or to memorize meanings of cards. To memorize, to have these positions, or when you do a card spread and you have this order, you can go any order you want to go. You can lay these cards in any order you want to lay them in. It doesn't make any difference. You could have just left to right. Um, you could just have left to right three rows here, nine cards, and then the tenth one at the bottom. It wouldn't make any difference as long as you have purpose in those meanings is what's important. So this isn't really, I still use the Celtic cross because that's what I learned with. That's just out of habit, but it really makes no difference. You could also change these meanings positions because now you know what we're doing with it. It's a strategy. So if I want to, if I, if numbers one and two positions on the Celtic cross are, this covers him and this crosses him, which is what the traditional meanings are. I don't like that. I don't care about that. So I changed all the meanings of my Celtic cross to things that I think are more important today. My card spread, I look into what, why, how, and when of a question. What is the real question? Why do you want this in your life? How are we going to get it? And when do you act? <laughs> Do we act now before opportunities are lost? Or do we act later in a more advantageous time for us to do something here and get some results? Those four aspects is what I look into. I use these 10 positions in relation to those four aspects. Numbers one and two position on my Celtic cross represent the question itself. Gives us an opportunity to look at the question closely, maybe rephrase the question, see if there's a, a different way of looking at it. Number three position, I like to look at what the client is currently going through right now, what efforts they're doing, what things that they're taking, what actions they're taking. Number four, and what they can do about it to change that. Number four position is what their um, immediate goal is what they're trying to accomplish right now. The first thing is immediately I want to try to get this done immediate goals. Number five position is an asset the client has that they should keep aware of, something they got going for them that they should use. Maybe they're not aware of that. Number six position is an opportunity coming in the, fu in the future that they should watch for. Number seven position I like to look at as number seven is position is how the client views their own question this allows me to question the client's viewpoint of their own question. They might be looking at something really bad and thinking of it as a very good thing, or vice versa. Maybe there's something very good and they're thinking of it as a bad thing. This allows me to question the client's viewpoint of their own question. Number eight position is when do we act? Act now before opportunities are lost or wait for a better time? Number nine position is what's the purpose of this question? Why do you want this in your life? What's the big picture? And number 10 position I use as details. Find things to look for as you go through this. Now most, most people will use a card spread. They'll say number 10 position is the final outcome. I don't care what the card spread is. It could be a horseshoe spread, gypsy spread, any spread. Ten, the last card is usually final outcome. And that's all the client cares about. Is the final outcome. They don't care about all this other stuff. They want to know if I'm going to get the job, or I'm going to sell the house, am I going to have the baby, or am I going to get married? That's what they want to know, that final outcome card. That's all they care about. But really, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's not fate. It's a matter of um, looking at your options and what you can do. And that's the prediction. I predict if you do this, this is what's going to happen. I predict if you do this over here, that's what's going to happen. And that's how that works. I don't believe in fate. I believe in free will. If there is a fate, 
it's the cards we've been dealt. You could look at them that way. And free will be, would be how we played those cards, if you believe in it at all. Some people get caught up in the psychic part of the tarot reading. I said, uh, this sparks your imagination, forcing me to use to see us make associations between a random tarot card placed into an element of a question. In some way, whether I make a, uh, an association metaphorically or, um, or what I'm seeing in the card or something, what I'm feeling from it, I'm going to make some connection there. I'm forcing myself to do that. Imagination is the side of the mind that uses that your intuition comes from. So a tarot reading can spark intuition because you're using that side of the mind. And it's just like any other thing. You develop it, you get better at it, and you'll use it, you'll find yourself seeing those things more because you you're using it. And that's what you're doing. There's no power to these cards. Um, there's no um, psychic awareness that um, it's going to give you um, in the way people usually think about it. I'm not going to tell you winning lottery numbers. If I could do that, I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> I'd be on my yacht somewhere. But this is that's just a, um, a stereotype that I think gets associated with the cards. So I hope this throws a little clarity on things. The, the, the creative thinking technique of conceptual blending and a tarot reading have the same purpose, to find an idea of something we're going to do in the, in the future. That's called the prediction. They're identical. The only difference is the tarot reader is way smaller scale things. It's more of a personal, one-on-one -on -one situation. It's like I said, selling a house, getting married, moving to Florida, where a creative consultant would be looking into the Hubble telescope, maybe some ph pharmaceutical companies uh, trying to find a cure for leukemia with something. Or uh, Artificial intelligence uses in conceptual blending as it progresses forward and advancing with their progress with that study. So they're working on, creative consultants are using this application, this intentional application of thought on huge projects. If Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos was sitting in this room right now and I was talking to them about what a tarot card reading is, they'd be saying, oh yeah, I, I see what you're doing. I see what you're talking about there. They would know. And I said, again, like I said, a creative consultant would use anything in the world for a random stimulus, and a tarot reader limits their deck, their, their, tarot, their random stimulus to a deck of tarot cards. But it's a very effective way to find answers, and the deck of tarot cards is a perfect tool as a random stimulus. Perfect tool. So whoever thought of this was a genius in the beginning. Because they saw a way of, they knew, they knew you had to break your question apart in the sections. That's nothing new. Great minds in the past have done that anyway. But then putting random tarot cards for ideas in there was, an, and it's an idea that stuck. And we're still doing it today. So I hope you like this. I want you to know that the, when you understand what you're doing with the cards, it puts a lot more clarity on, so this makes sense now, what I'm, what I'm learning here. The card spread makes sense, or meanings of cards can be identified in ways that make sense now. And it all starts to connect together, and before we didn't have that. So um, I hope you like this, and thanks for listening. So what it sounds like is that really the the trick to the tarot is the intuition. Do you even need the tarot cards themselves in order to do a reading? No. You're right. You don't need them. Okay. Linda, my 
life partner over there. She uh, started with me, we started in 93. She um, used to use playing cards. There you, there you go. She could read better, better. She's a better reader than I am. Try being married to a psychic for 23 years and see what you say you get along with it. <laughs> what are you thinking? I'm, I'm just watching. When she tells me, I just look at the wall. I just start, stare at the wall. That way I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I'm not thinking of nothing. She used playing cards. Playing cards don't have any symbols on them. And now she doesn't use any cards. She says, I don't even need the cards. If you want, I'll throw cards out. She'll tell you where the cards are. If you want, I'll throw cards down for you. But no, you're not, they're not needed. If you could find ways to stir your imagination and your intuition without the cards, the cards help you do it. But um, they're just one way of doing it, yes. You're right. You don't need them. This might be, you know, similar to his question. But why would you limit yourself to just 78 cards when, as you said, you have these other creative people who will take anything? Why, why did anyone get started with the cards in the first place? I think originally they were thinking that that was the only way. To, you, you had to have those cards. I want to get my cards. I think people were thinking you had to have them in your hand. Originally, these were looked at as something physically and magical, and um, now we know better, I think. Well, no, I, oh, I do, anyway. Um, so, yeah, you, originally, I think that that, that, was, that was just what they implied. We, we know more today than we did then. But I think the mindset is so strong that this is a magical deck of cards that um, really that's what it is, it's a mindset. And originally, that was their thinking then. I don't know why they thought it then, but um, that's about all I can really say about that. You know, yeah, it's it's changing though. It's changing. So if that's that's, that's what their thinking was back then, why they used tarot cards? Why not? Why just seventy-eight cards instead of everything in the world around them? It was a system that they implied had magic. A deck of cards, again, the tactic looks like it's a, it's a strong illusion. There's magic in these cards. No, that's like building a house and saying, the Stanley tool, the Stanley tool hammer is better than the Ace Hardware tool hammer. I'll have a better house if I use a Stanley tool hammer than the Ace Hardware tool hammer. It's just a tool. This is just a tool. But they, they looked at it as something magical, something more than it really was. Thank you. I have two questions. Okay. The first one is about the question. When you come and, and somebody has a question, how narrow does it have to be or broad or what kind, like what questions work or don't work? That's the first question. My, then my second question is, is this more of a prediction that this is going to happen based upon what we're seeing in creative thinking or is it by going through this process, you're planting seeds that then become reality? So you kind of made, made it happen from the creative thinking process? Well, to answer, answer your second question first, I would say that, that the, the, if so, usually somebody's trying to accomplish something. And I think that the, 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 the prediction is a choice. Um, in other words, I'm saying, if you do this, what I'm predicting is that you'll, you'll be okay, you'll, do, you'll be fine. Um, an example is, let's say, a job interview. If you, um, if you don't go to this job interview today, call up and cancel tomorrow, tomorrow's interview because tell them you got something you have to do, but you'll be there the next day, which doesn't make any sense. But let's just say that's what I told you. I'm telling you, you have a better chance of succeeding if you do that. Um, so it's just me telling you that that's what I'm seeing as your best chance to accomplish what you're doing. I don't believe in fate. You, I'm, I don't say you're going to get a job. If you don't want that job, you're not going to get it. That's my thing. Um, and I don't believe people have their destiny cut out for them. And your first question, the more specific the question is, the more specific the answer can be. 
So if somebody has a specific question, yeah, I'll give them a specific answer. If somebody has a question like, um, you know, what's my purpose in life? I, I you know, <laughs> don't worry, be happy. <laughs> you know, I don't. <laughs> I, you know, it's it's going to be a it's going to be a vague direction. But if they want to know if they're going to sell their house by September, that's a direct question. Or um, should I start? A, should I have? I, I own a funeral home. And I want to. <laughs> I want to own a funeral home. He coughed when I said that. Um, I want to open up a second one in the next neighborhood. Should I do that? That's a legitimate question. Uh, but, and that's uh, that just came to my mind because that was a question I had once recently. But um, that's a specific question which can get a specific answer. So the more specific the question is, the better. The more specific the answers can be. In my thinking, the way I read, anyway, yeah. And everybody, like I said, everybody reads differently. Though. I know some great readers, uh, friends of ours, you know, and they, everybody reads differently. So that's what I do. The tarot often uses um, archetypes to act as that stimulus. Uh -huh. um, and one of the things that I found a little surprising tonight is how you use time in your reading, um, the, the when, <clears throat> which I think is often difficult if you're reading maybe some of the traditional tarot book reading, you know, the uh, yeah. explanations for what the cards are. Could you talk a little bit about how you use time in your readings? Um, that's real. That's a good question because that's usually what people ask a lot. Number eight position on my Celtic cross is time, and um, I have people I know, uh, the, the friends of mine here that just that have asked me that. What do you, you know? Narrow narrow me in on that with the time thing. I don't look at time really as a dates. I don't, for the most part, I just look at when to act. Is now a good time or should we wait? And if it's a wait. Then it becomes intuitive and how long to wait. I don't look at dates as saying, well, I should, I, for the most part, as, as a general rule, I don't look at it and say, well, I see the 21st of next month or I see something specific like that. So I don't see time that way. I just see as far as actions being taken, when is the time to act? And, and um, I think that that's important uh, lots of times with a reading. And I think that's all you really need to know. How long will it take to get it done? That's a legitimate question with time. And a lot of people want to know that from number eight. They say, well, the time, how long is this going to take to happen? And that would be, that won't be answered in, in position eight. That would be answered by maybe a combination of all the cards looked at together with different... Um, Intuitive feelings of what I'm getting it would just be a very intuitive insight to that. I might look at a, I might see the, the seven, the chariot card in the sixth position, and that's number seven of the major arcana. So I say, well, the seventh month of the year. Um, and, you know, it might be something like that comes to me. I might see the moon card somewhere. And I think, well, by the next full moon, next thirty days. So it becomes very intuitive. But number eight position with me is just: do we act now? Or do we wait? And, I, and lots of times that's very useful information to somebody. And as far as the archetypes go, that's Carl Jung, and I love it. I got um, Jung and the Tarot by Sally Nichols. It's a great book on that. I don't use, really, the archetypes. Um, but um, there's, there's a lot there as far as studying with the symbolism of the cards and in relation to that, yeah. So it's good stuff. When you when you said you use the one and two position to look at the question itself, on my Celtic cross, yes. Yeah, could you expand on what you mean by that? Like, how would you look at a question? How how do you use those two cards to pick it apart? Lots of times, people have um, they have a question. They think they know the they think they know their question, and you could talk with them. And go deeper and find out that their question, there's something underlying even that, that it, it's a lot deeper than what they're asking. Those two cards, the two cards there, I think is important because that's what we're looking at is the actual question. 
if I see cards there that seem um, deceptive or vague in some way, it helps me think, are they, are they really seeing things correctly? Are they really seeing this question the right way? Um, so it just helps me do that. I, I would say that that's how I look at those two positions. You can look at them any way you need to for that particular reading, whatever that reading happens to be. But I like to look at numbers one and two to look to really study and look into the question because this, this helps you understand where this person's coming. You're, you're looking at their question and you're questioning their question because of those two cards. And any way that comes up to you from what those two cards are is good, even if you're wrong. You're just checking it out. Saying, Why, are you seeing things right here? You think you're seeing things okay? Well, what about this? Is this what's really happening? You know, people might say, I'm, I'm, um, I want to get a different job. Or will, will I get, no, will I get a raise, let's say. And you say, why do you want to raise? Well, I want to be happier at my job. And if I'm making more money, I'll be happier. Well, really, are you going to be happier at your job if you're making more money? You know, some people think they will. They will for a couple of weeks, and then it's going to be the same old job again. So people, lots of times, don't really know what the real question is. Maybe you look at them and say, okay, maybe you should look about another career. Maybe not a raise. That helps those two cards, and number seven, how they're seeing their own question. You use the pointer, seven, and to numbers one and two. Um, that helps me to see that they're seeing, um, they're on the same page with their own question. Oh, I'd like to answer one question before I even hear it. So I'm gonna answer this one. People will say to me, Vince, what you're saying makes a lot of sense, but, I've seen the tar I've seen the reading where the perfect cards come up in that reading and it all came true and happened. Perfect cards came up. How do you explain that? And I can't explain that. Any tarot card laid into any position in the card spread can give you good ideas. So they all seem like the perfect card. And if you get an insight from it, and it came true. It looks like those cards were the most perfect cards to come up. They all work. They all give you ideas. So that's why. So go ahead. I just wanted. I didn't mean to. I just wanted to say that. Since your cards are already in your hand, do you mind giving us a live demonstration? Um, well, I could do it up here, but I can't throw cards up there. I could tell you what I could do for it. Here's what I, here's what I would rather do than that. I would do something on the table here. But to, back to what I was talking about with the strategy. Ever, anybody here ever heard of the three-card spread? A lot of you probably heard of the three-card spread. It's the most basic spread there is. Past, present, and future. Nobody questions past, present, and future three-card spread. Why do we, why do we, why do, we do three-card spread? Why, why do we just use past, present, and future? Because we've been told that that's what it is. But this is positions of a question. So instead of past, present, and future, we could change this. It's, if I want to open up a coffee house, or if I want to do something like this, past, present, and future doesn't help me too much. So I said, well, don't use that spread then. Use a different spread. Well, you could change that to past, present, and future to something else. Why don't you change it to strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities? That's a lot more meaningful than past, present, and future, wouldn't it be? Or how about positive aspects, negative aspects, and conclusions? Nobody's going to arrest you if you do that. So but past, present, and future, yeah, I could take the cards, what I would do, shuffle them up, and then I would, I would was, that's a good way to practice the cards. Because as you're laying cards down, <laughs> I throw over an instruction card. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Six of Cups, overcoming obstacles, new paths with the Page of Wands, allows me to take action with the Knight of Wands. Those three cards right now, I just made a, a statement with three cards. That's a good way to practice. Because you could, you could start talking as you're laying cards over. And that's what I call reading fluently. 
instead of saying, well, this is past, this is present, and this is future, well, I just want to make a sentence. I want to make a statement of some type of meaning here. Overcoming the obstacles I've overcome in the past is allowing me right now to look at different options in the, in, in the present with new paths to go on, allowing me to take actions in the future I see that are work out very well. Patience and understanding with the Queen of Wands putting me in a very good position right now with a lot of inspiration with the Temperance card. I'm going to learn a lot from this situation with the King of Wands. It's a good way to practice. Just start practicing talking and throwing over the cards. As you're and this is why key words instead of three or four sentence definition meanings work better. Because it allows you to see the card through your eyes and it allows it to fit in well with other cards as you're putting things together to try to come up with some type of strategy or meaning that's going to be useful for a client. It works. So when you've got your layout, do you ever find yourself in a position where you may need to put down extra cards for additional inspiration because something has, isn't completely clear even after looking at your spread? Yeah. A good way to do that is you could, you could take your spread into a different dimension. What I mean by that is instead of just linear, you could lay cards on top of other cards. So if I was going to do a three-card spread, putting three cards down, and as I'm talking to the person and we want to go deeper, I could put three cards over the top of those first three cards, and I can go back and look and see how those two cards interact with each other to go a little bit deeper into that question with somebody. So putting it in layers, by layering on top of the other cards, helps a lot. Instead of picking up the cards and putting down new cards, I like to lay them on top of the old ones. And I can look back, well, what was underneath there again? Oh, the, oh, the Six of Wands with the King of Swords. Okay, yeah, okay. Well, before I just had the Six of, six of Wands. This allows me to, to put some depth into it by going deeper, like you're saying. I think I, that's what I do. And it works out well. So, um, in, terms of, in terms of the symbolism of each card, um, so I'm still new to this, right? So sometimes I don't know what a card is supposed to mean, but I looking at it, it gives me a feel, a vibe. Okay, this could be this or that, and I go with that. Right, uh, is that a good strategy, or should I learn what the 78 cards, you know, mean each and every one of them? I know professional readers that never read a book on the tarot. And they, they're just as good as I am, or anybody else I know. If you feel confident that you're getting ideas from those cards without some book, and it's working for you, you're doing very well. And I, was, I would use that. I mean, it's, it's good to, it's, actually I would say, buy my book though. <laughs> no, no. What I was saying is that it's good to have that as a base. I feel I like this card's meaning what I say it is, what I think it is. Yeah, I'll read about what this guy says it is or this woman says it is, but I still like what I'm feeling. So it's like look at their suggestions as as just that suggestions, but don't let it interfere with what you're doing already. If you you might see something you like, you really learned something from it. But if, you, but if you feel like you, what you're doing is working better, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Because ultimately, that's what the book is supposed to be trying to get you to do anyway. Get you your own feelings on those cards. So you go, it would be going backwards. You know, I already got feelings for these cards. Now I'll read the book. Well, that's just a confirmation then or seeing how, what, seeing how they disagree with you or, or, or agree with you. And that's fine. But uh, if you got a style and you're comfortable with it, You'll do just fine. So I assume from how you're talking when you work with your clients that it's a collaborative process where you're asking them to go deeper and look and so forth. And But when you gave our the little example, it's almost like you could do it without even having another person on the other side. So how, mm -hmm. how much weight does the collaboration in a reading mean to you or should it? Um, that's That's... That's a good point because I, a lot of people think you're not supposed to ask the client anything when they're learning the cards. They think, well, I'm just supposed to know what's going on here as I'm laying these cards out. I ask the client a lot of questions. I want to know, you know, what, if it's about 
let's say you just met somebody. Oh, let's say you're going, are you, I want to know about my boyfriend. That's a pretty common one. I'll ask, how long have you been going out? Are you guys getting along right now? When was the last time he called? I'll ask questions like that. Are you happy with things? I, don't, I, I want to know what you know so I can tell you what you don't know. And I would also say, so, so, I, so collaboration, yes. It's, I think it's important to be able to talk with them. And, it, and if people really are serious about finding an answer to something, they'll be more than happy to talk to you about it. And they'll be happy to answer your question. You know, if you have a question for them about that, they'll, they'll answer you. I, I just did a YouTube on last year about, about how, um, about something like that. I'll ask questions, just especially, I love a first date. Because I think it's a great thing to, to know. I mean, people will say, well, I just met this guy, and we went out, and I want to know about him. I'll ask, where did he take you? <laughs> <laughs> because that could tell you a lot. If you say, oh, you took me to the show and went to have dinner afterwards, that's boring. You know, that's typical, normal kind of guy. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I mean, it's very stable. Sounds like a very stable person, very traditional. Did he open the door for you to, move, to pull your chair out? Stuff like this. That's usually that type of a person. Or did he take you to a rock concert? Or did he um, um, take you to some computer convention? There are different ter personalities there that will come up showing what kind of date that first date was. Maybe he just wanted to go to your house with a bottle of wine and talk about life. That's a romantic you know, or you got the guy who just took you to see the movie and then dinner. That's just, um, that's the, the typical, that's the, the traditional type of person. Um, the one who goes to the rock concert's uh, um, an adventurous type of person. Um, so it just, you can find things out by hearing about what, the, what, if you could ask them the questions, it gives you some insight to paint a picture a little bit better of what you're dealing with. So collaboration is very good, yes. And um, you'll have it. What do you do if a person has certain questions as to what they should do with their life and they've been stuck on trying to find an answer for years? I'm answering it. I'm asking this in a very general term, but it can deal with specifics as well. And it's on a personal note, it's a very serious problem for me. Okay. I would say, well, don't you really, you know, something like that, again, that's a very general thing. There could be a lot of reasons why they're stuck. Um, but uh, you might want to ask them, what do you feel is making you stuck? You could almost get like a counselor then and say, what's making you, what's, why do you feel like you're stuck? What is it, your job, your relationship, your uh, career, uh, your, your just because you have no interest? Or you're depressed, or th so it's, it's almost like a counseling thing, and you, you're going to be able to, if you can look for certain questions to ask that you think might help unstuck the person. That's about all you can really do. I, I can't really tell somebody what their pursuits of happiness should be. I can help guide them on trying to find their own, but you have to keep it general that way, and. Um, I, I could only tell a person like that, just follow your heart. As long as you're not hurting anybody else, do what you want to do. And if something's holding you back from doing that, we have to find a way to get around that so it's not holding you back anymore. And that's about a, probably all I would really say. Okay, thank you. Uh, have you ever found yourself in the situation where you see something is really terrible going on in, in the person's life, and that's exactly what your intuition tells you. Uh, if so, would you use a protective language? Protective? Or, you wouldn't just tell it as it is, or you would tell it as it is. Um, it's kind of a moral question. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Well, I, here's, here's, here's what I feel. If, if it's something... If it's something that's going to affect other people, I don't want to do that based on an intuitive thing. 
is my husband cheating on me? I'm not going to say that your husband's cheating on you. I'll have Rocky waiting by my car some night. He's going to want to punch me in the nose. You know, I, I don't, and, and I don't, I'm not going to do that on, on the turn of a card anyway. I might say, you, need, you and your husband obviously are having trouble. You need to talk this over. I, I see him being unhappy because you're not happy. So you two are unhappy. You, 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 I see you need to talk here and find out what's going on. Um, I was thinking more about health. Health, 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 there you go, talk to them like they're a family member. I'm not going to give a diagnosis based on a tarot card. I'll, tell them, I'll ask them, you're seeing your doctor? What is your doctor saying? And if they don't like what their doctor is saying, I'll say you should get a second opinion. But I won't say that their doctor is wrong. Or you shouldn't, don't worry about getting that test because the doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. No, you can get in trouble for that. Um, if, if it's a health issue, if somebody's concerned about their health, I would just say, if you, I would focus on the doctor and say, if, are you confident with this doctor you have? And, and, and um, that's the best you can do for them. You know, but yeah, it's, and that's, a, that's a good question too because that, those are issues people got. I just had a test. I'm waiting for the results to come back. It's still three days. I want to know now, what do you see? And I get him, and I tell him, well, I, how does your doctor feel about this? And he says, well, he thinks it's going to be okay. Well, I said, well, it's probably going to be okay. It's all like you're talking to somebody who's a family member. Just make them feel better. And there's really nothing more you can do about it. I, I've, I've, um, I wouldn't try to go there with intuition. No. Uh, Vince, can I just ask, like, you know, if you are using the cards to answer a question like that, is it possible that, you know, a spread of cards, and I know nothing about this, but a sp certain cards probably are normally regarded as not good. Is that correct? Yes. So if you got somebody comes with a question like that, and then you got this spread of cards, and you see that, I mean, what would your intuition, what would you do? What, like if that, the death what, card came up, yeah. and it's on health, well, usually what I'll try to do is, is talk with them about how, what they feel their condition is. And if, if, let's say the devil card comes up. You could look at that as, a, well, it's a negative thing that's in their environment. You could also look at it as you're seeing things in a negative way. Um, or you're afraid to go to the doctor. You're afraid of the test results you might get. Um, I try to keep it all on positive note. I won't, as far as, giving them hope on what they should do. I don't look at I don't look at negative cards and saying this doesn't look good for your health. You know <laughs> but, but you know I, I will say that I see you you know you need to go to the doctor, make sure you you you're up on up on things, but I won't I won't go there, no. Because for one thing, if you're wrong, you see a bunch of negative cards come up, the tower, the devil, this death card come up and you say, well, geez, your health doesn't look good. <laughs> you know, you just, you, you, you just had a, a you, you got waiting for a test results. I don't like this at all. Well, maybe they got three days before their test results come back. Now there'll be three days of anxiety for, because of what I told them. And the test re results come back, they're fine. They're going to look at, they're gonna, you know, what'd you do? You put me through all this hell for nothing. I just, the doctor says I'm okay. You tell me I got all this gloom and doom. No, I won't do that, uh, you know. No, it's not good. I'm not going to try to be a doctor. So, the tarot cards will tell you a lot, but there's other things I think you're better off leaving at. I will tell you one. Here's what I've done. I have done where I've seen intuition, where I've gone. I've touched a little bit there. Um, right away, deck the Queen of Wands. She's holding a staff in one hand. And in the other hand, she has a flower, a big flower. And um, I forgot what hands they are. But a woman asked me about her mother. She said, my mother's health. How's my mother's health? And I did see intuitively, and this just came out intuitively. And like I said, these things will happen because you're using that side of the mind. So let's say the staff was in the right hand and the flower was in the left. And, and I said... I said to her, I said, 
she said, How, how's my mother's health? And I looked and I said, was it breast cancer? Is it breast cancer? And she said, yes. I said, was the breast, left breast removed? And she said, yes. And I said, the right one is well in hand because she had that staff. So she'll be okay. But I said, obviously, keep in touch with your doctor, too. That was intuitive. Now, that card doesn't mean breast cancer is okay, bad for the left breast. It's just the way I saw that card at the time from that question. And it worked. So those things can come up. Yes. This question is for you. Um, since this seems to be more a process and dissecting and imagination and intu intuition and all that tied together to to think through everything. Mm -hmm. do you, because you do it so often and you use this tool in the process, does it become second nature and that's the way your brain thinks in your own life with everything? And do you find that your clients, if they come frequently, they can start to do it almost on their own by in deploying some of these same things just in their day-to-day -day thinking? I don't have any clients that after a while, I have a lot of clients, I have clients I've read for 20 years, same client. And none of them, I've read enough where they say, you know, I could do this. I could, if I'm going to answer my own questions, I know what you're doing. And no, they, they just assume, they want to talk with me, just like we always have. And um, so I, I think that that, you know, that, that, as far as that goes, no, they, they, um, they always want to still hear what I got to say. As far as, um, do it, does it affect my thinking? Because you're right, you're, my head's in the clouds a lot with this. So do I come back to earth? You know, and fortunately for me, I'm I'm a, I'm down to earth type of person, anyway. So I'm pretty grounded, and but I can get up there with this. And, and <laughs> but I got friends. We got friends that read, and and uh, friends of ours, they never touch the ground. Some of these people. But they're wonderful friends, and they have a wonderful imagination. And it's just, just the way they are. I, I, so with me personally, I'm able to read and, and shut it off afterwards. And, and, um, and I'm also able to get in there when I want to. And a lot, lots of times it's just by myself. I like to spend a lot of time by myself. Thinking, I think it's not a lot of time, but I mean, there's a part of the day I like to do that, where I let that part of my mind just go. But um, so everybody's different on that. I, I think that um, it's good that we realize that we live in the physical world, and you got to live. You got to remember that that's there too, and you know it's good to keep that in mind. You know, and. Um, um, have a balance between the two. And um, I think most people can do that just fine. I don't see any danger in learning these cards. <laughs>